guys, welcome to the newest episode of The Bearded Gamer Show. Now, as always, I'm your host, The Bearded Gamer, Chris Arnone. Now, before I get into good news, bad news, got a couple things to talk about. First off, you guys are awesome. Have I told you that re recently? Well, I should. And this is how. I have hit over 4,000 subscribers now. And in fact, that means I am giving away my two Smite beta keys. So, randomly chosen from the people who commented on that particular video, Daniel Rod 987 I'm not going to try to figure out what your name means, and OSRazor37. I will be messaging the two of you shortly with your Smite beta keys. All right, cool stuff. Now, another little piece of news before I get into the good news, bad news. I was recently on a little podcast video called Pixel Blips. It's a couple guys local to me here in Kansas City. Uh, a couple really neat guys. We had a, a little uh, Twitter feud going on uh, about my ty tirade about uh, Japanese games and the double standard. Uh, but then we were also talking, I, I was out of town and couldn't come and talk to them about that. Uh, but then we were talking about uh, GameStop and their retro gaming uh, online store that they're looking to launch. And one of the guys from there is a real big retro gamer. So a little uh, riff back and forth about that. And of course, we also talked about gender and hate in the video game industries with gamers themselves, you know, uh, sort of touching base on my recent interviews with Wick Thomas and Nicole. Uh, and all that. So it's really cool. Here's the link, Pixel Blips. There's a link straight to the video. Okay, so you can go check that out. Uh, a couple really cool guys. Maybe I'll be appearing on their show in the future. We'll have to see what the cards hold. It's getting that good news, bad news. So we're going to start off, unfortunately, with a piece of bad news. Now, Andrea Sang is like the place to go in the, if you're a Westerner and speak English and read English to find out about what's going on with Japanese games, all right? Uh, now, this is a, a guy named Anoop Gantayat. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, but he founded this website quite a while back and has just always been, you know, speaks you know, fluent Japanese and gives us news directly from the homeland of video games right to our Western eyeball so we can read it and understand it, okay? Well, he is going to be shutting down his site. Uh, he's announced just very recently that he is going to be moving on to non-gaming ventures. And while the, the site will still be there in memoriam and there's going to be some other things there, he will no longer be posting news about the gaming industry in Japan. So it's, it's, it's very tough. I mean, that's like the go-to place for information about Japanese games. So some good news, okay? The rest of it's good news, I know, because that one's a really sad one. Cool thing here, the American Dental Association, wait, games, right? Okay, stick with me, all right? Is offering up free codes for plants versus zombies that you can give out to kids in lieu of candy at Halloween, all right? Now, you know, we've always had stuff like people give you dental floss or people give you, you know, things that aren't cool. You know, when you were a kid, you're like, oh, what is this? I don't want this. We're talking plants versus zombies. A video game. I mean, if I was a kid, I would have taken a video game any day of the week over a bag of candy. Period. I, who wouldn't? I'm a gamer. What can I say? I grew up a gamer. Uh, it, it's actually called Operation Stop Zombie Mouth, which I think is just awesome. So, really cool. You can go pick those codes up for free. Just head over to the American Dental Association, or of course, you could just Google Operation Stop Zombie Mouth and, and get some of those for the kids who are going to be walking around trick-or-treating. Some more good news. Steam has officially launched Big Picture Mode into beta. Now, what is Big Picture Mode? It sounds a little weird. A lot of people recently have been hooking up their PCs to their televisions recently. That should be nothing new, right? You know, I've got a 55-inch television. Yeah, it's pretty cool when I hook up my high-end gaming rig to my TV. It's pretty cool. A little bit of a pain in the butt to move the rig all the way over there, but still, it's neat. Well, but the problem is when you do that, even if you've got, you know, the cables to reach with your mouse and your keyboard, the text is awfully small if you're reading your computer screen on the television. You know, depend on your distance. I guess if you have like a three foot deep living room, it's not a big deal. I don't. Uh, so big picture mode is really about using the television and that distance and that a bit of a loss of pixel depth. I mean, you just can't get the pixel depth on a big screen TV like you can get on a really nice computer monitor. And it's also an interface that's really nice for a controller. Now I know, I know the PC gamers out there are just trolling and crying, crying foul. No, 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 it's keyboard and mouse all the way. Guess what, I play Fallout and Skyrim with a controller on my PC. <laughs> Deal, I don't care. That's how I like to play it, it's fun. Uh, so, you know, the fact that I could just hook up the controller and navigate to the game and launch it. Now granted, you can't use a keyboard or a controller for every game, Civ Five. Even if they had built it in there, I just don't, I can't even fathom how that would actually work. 
that's a mouse and keyboard game, okay? Really, it's mostly just a mouse game, but still. Point being, for a lot of those games, controller's nice, and more than anything, it just helps with the distance. It makes it much easier to read and navigate from your couch. Finish off with more good news. Now, this one's a little weird. EA has now admitted that BioWare pretty much has full creative freedom. And this is something I imagine that not a lot of studios that are under EA's umbrella get, even though they did come out and say both PopCap and DICE also have this freedom. Of course, you're looking at three of their you know, developers that make some of the most money for them. Uh, now that they're saying that Casey Hudson, who is sort of the creative genius behind most of what Bioware does, if he has a story idea, if it's a new IP, whatever, they will give him the financial backing. Now, I, I just think that's pretty cool, and it really does explain a lot of why maybe Bioware originally signed up with EA. A lot of people have had sort of a disconnect there, why such a successful developer uh, with so much, you know, creativity and artistry would sign on with what some people would be sort of the devil of publishing in uh, video games. But of course, you know, while they may give them creative freedom, I'm sure that doesn't stop EA from shoving multiplayer down whatever game that is throat and then selling an online pass to go with it because they're still EA, right? Yeah. All right. That's almost a controller confessional, but not quite. I still have a real controller confessional for you. So anybody who watches the show knows I'm pretty excited about the upcoming game, Dishonored. It's a brand new IP, but it's sort of like, you know, Thief meets Steampunk meets Bioshock. I just love those things and really looking forward to this game. Uh, but of course, I'm cautiously optimistic. It is a new IP. And well, recently there's been a few that has kind of fired up between Arcane Studios, the developers for Dishonored, and EA Online. Now, what this stemmed from is Frank Gibbo, the head of EA, uh, said in an interview, and I'm going to quote here, as much as there's a desire for new IPs, the market doesn't reward new IP late in the cycle. They end up going, doing okay, but not really breaking through. Uh, in that same interview, he also talks about they have three or five brand new IPs that are being developed for the next gen, but they're not releasing them until that next gen actually gets here. Um, now, Julian Roby from Arcane uh, was asked directly about this and about a new IP and launching a new IP this late. And he said, once again, I quote, if the game is good and it gets a good review and it's marketed properly, people will want to look at it. Uh, he also talks about, you know, the sequelitis that's happening during the holiday season. That's my word, not his. Uh, but if you look at most of the games that are coming out this holiday, it's, you know, a sequel. Assassin's Creed 3, Borderlands 2, Need for Speed, I don't know, 22? I don't, whatever. I'm still excited about the game, but don't get me wrong. It's, there's a lot of them. Forza Horizon, okay, that's the fifth Forza game. There's a lot of sequels. That's a lot of building off these established brands. And he said, I quote again, I really think people are starving for something new, something new in terms of universe, something new in terms of gameplay, something new in terms of visuals. And granted, I'm sure Frank Gabot has some very solid numbers at his disposal to back up when, in a console's life cycle, these new IPs are successful. But there's a lot of factors going on. I mean, you got to wonder about the PC gaming renaissance that's occurring right now and how, how powerful that market is right now and whether that would have an influence on it. Uh, but I also very much agree with what Julian Roby is saying. you got to have those... I, I say less, less about the game scores. If you have a good game, it's going to get good scores. It, it should. Let's Assuming that all video game reviewers are fair and are not, and are not buy, bought off, which that's the assumption I always make. I was never bought off as a reviewer, and I can still tell you that GamerReview.com, who uh, I post my videos up on, but I don't write for them anymore, those guys, nobody buys them off either. So I just let's just make the assumption together. Nobody gets bought off, okay? So if a game's good, it's going to get good review scores, but then it's also really about marketing. Got a couple cases in point here. Now, first off, here's a game that was fantastic but the marketing didn't exist. Enslaved Odyssey to the West. I love this game. Anybody who's gotten a chance to play this game loves this game, but you pretty much kind of heard about it a little bit and then nothing. And then you find out, wait, that game came out? That was like six months ago. Nobody bought it. Nobody heard about it. It never got into the public consciousness. Even though it was great, we're just never going to see another one. And then you have the opposite side of the scale where you can have an okay game with this massive marketing campaign, such as Homefront. I mean, the marketing for this thing was insane. There were television commercials everywhere. I remember at GDC, they did a concert, all right? There were flyers. There was a, a like, truck that looked like it was from, you know, that war-torn era that was selling Korean food. Uh, yeah, they just did anything and everything they could to push this game. 
which was four hours long. <laughs> and, I, and what was there was just okay. The multiplayer was okay. And that's just not gonna get a new IP off the ground. It doesn't matter how much you market it, you gotta have a good game. Uh, but you know, maybe review scores do mean something. Let's take a look at, say, Deadly Premonition. Now, I personally reviewed this game and lambasted it. I thought it was terrible. But I also understand it was a cult classic, and in some ways it was trying to sort of be so bad it was good. And it really did some really weird, quirky things really well. But honestly, it's also the first game I ever fell asleep playing. Literally, driving from point A to point B. Driving. Slowly. Oh. Yeah, I'd remember that if I ever have problems falling asleep. Just go buy that game again. But anyway, you know, this is a game that was all over the place. I gave it a really low review score. Destructo gave it a 10 out of 10, for God's sakes. I mean, what is someone supposed to make of that game when the review scores are totally out of whack? And really, that has more to do with the reviewers than the game itself. But my point is still made. Uh, but I also have to wonder, you know, EA's talking about they have three to five new IPs lined up for the next gen. Can we get new IP overload? Can we get too much new at once? I, I think any gamer is only willing to take a chance on a new IP once in a great while, but they're still going to stick to the franchises they know and love. So I've got to worry about that. But I must say gamers do want new IPs. You know, As an artist myself, I very much look forward to these new IPs, these new adventures, new stories, new places, all these things that Roby is talking about. And... Uh, but I also got to say that any publisher has to support a new IP. I think if a publisher is going to launch a new intellectual property into the scene, they need to commit to two games. Don't say one. Commit to two right off the bat. Uh, games that did. Metro 2033. The game sold like 0.62 million copies total, and yet we're getting another one because the game was great. And now if they learn their mistakes from the first one, give it a good marketing campaign, it should be a lot bigger. Another one... Go back to THQ, I want to give him a hug for this, is Darksiders. The original, less than 2 million copies, all right? A little over a million, really. But now Darksiders 2 comes out, and it's absolutely fantastic. One of my favorite games I have played this year, hands down. And then we got, of course, an unending list of games that have yet to ever see an actual sequel. Of course, we'll go to the easy ones like Mirror's Edge. Everyone's been clamoring for one of those for a long time. I already talked about it in Slaved Odyssey to the West. And of course, let's go retro, something like Earthbound, that has never seen a sequel. You know, that's why I say, if you're going to commit to a game, commit to at least two iterations of that game. Give the developers and the publisher, the marketing, everybody, a chance to make their mistakes on that first game, learn from them, and then make a second game that makes the first one completely obsolete and blows it out of the water. Those are my favorite franchises. All right? So, Frank, shut up. Sit down. Let's have more artistry, more creativity, more new IPs in this sphere that we love so much called gaming. Just maybe spread them out a little bit. That does it for my controller confessional and this video. See you guys next time.